Hello, uh, I'm Steve Revel from RS Open, and uh, thank you all for coming today. It's great to see a lot of faces that uh, are regulars at these shows, and it's also good to see new faces and people coming along to our stand and speaking to us who we've not met before. Uh, it's great to know that Risk RS is uh, growing again and becoming uh, more widely used and more widely recognised. Um, today on our stand we're showing a number of things that are new to the London show. Uh, we've got a few exclusive previews of things that are soon to appear in the Risk RS uh, market. Uh, for example, we've got uh, a board called Codename Titanium, which will be coming on sale uh, in November. It's not made by Riscos Open, we were just helping with a bit of the porting. Um, so there are free leaflets that we're handing out that people can find out more about. Um, you can also speak to CJE and Arcomp to find out more from them about what their plans are for settlements. Uh, we have a load of books that we've been working hard on updating, so some long overdue overhauls have been done to a lot of developer manuals. Uh, for example, the, the DDE manual and the assembler manual, the C compiler manuals. These all haven't been touched for about 20 years, so we've been behind the scenes working very hard on getting those all up to date. Um, and we have uh, the usual range of merchandise that we're selling primarily to help fund our activity. So for the, those of you who are new to Risk RS Open, I uh, just want to give a couple of minutes just to say what we do, what we're trying to achieve, and then I'll hand over to our guest speaker, Paul Fellows. So Risk RS Open was set up in 2006. Our goal was to turn the Risk RS operating system, originally developed by Acorn, into uh, an open source project that everyone's free to contribute to. Uh, to try and help uh, allow it to be used on newer generations of hardware uh, than existed in the previous RISC-OS markets. So, at that time, RISC-OS was in a steep decline. There was not much new happening. It was all owned by one right company, front. and that company uh, looked like it had a limited lifespan ahead of it. So, we thought if RISC-OS stayed under wraps being a closed source operating system in a few years time would be dead and disappeared and this kind of what we think is a vital part of British computing history would disappear forever. So we've been working hard to bring it uh, open source out into the community and to try and grow a community around it again and get new developers involved, new users involved and just new projects spinning up around it. Uh, so here we are quite a few years later now uh, nine years, I think, later, and I'm happy to say we've we've met all of our original original goals. We've met quite a few of our stretch goals that we had, um, and we're we're now throwing a lot more stuff open into, out into the community to allow the community to come up with the ideas, and allow them to do what they think is good for Risk OS. And there are a few fundamental bits of development that we're still steering and we're still sponsoring. Uh, on our website we have a thing called the Bounty Scheme and that's open for anyone to donate money into. Um, and what happens there is hopefully these pots of money that we're maintaining on our website will help attract developers in from outside the community potentially. People that don't have a lot of free time but are willing to do something for a bit of money. Um, and we will point them at key bits of development that we see as being essential to keeping RiskOS growing in the future. We don't want the hardware to march away and for RiskOS to be stuck in old hardware again. So, I won't take up too much more time, I'll just introduce Paul Fellows. So Paul, formerly of Acorn, is someone I uh, interact with on a fairly regular basis. Um, and he has a lot of inside knowledge about the early history of RiskOS and the forerunner of RiskOS, which was called Project Arthur. So, Paul. Fantastic to be here and to see so many people interested in all the mistakes I made 30 years ago. <laughs> uh, uh, thanks to Steve Ruskos uh, Open for inviting me down to talk to you. I did a talk about, I think it was three years ago, for Google um, in a pub in London. Um, and I've 
basically going to tell the same story again. So apologies if you already heard it, but um, uh, this is history, so it will be largely the same. I have been point had a few of my mistakes in the talk pointed out to me, and I'll try and get it right this time, because memory does fade. This is 30 years of my life, um, and it's 30 years ago, last month, that uh, Project Arthur was kicked off, as you can see in the talk, it was September 1985, and I got uh, drafted in to do this. So, I'm going to go back a little bit further than that, and I'm, it's fantastic to see so many BBC micros here. Um, so, what talk could possibly start without a picture of one? My first computer that I owned was uh, a BBC Micro. I got this when I was at college and it completely distracted me from my chemistry degree. Um, I did uh, natural science uh, part two chemistry at uh, Cambridge University and then spent so much time playing with one of these that not only was I essentially working for Acorn Self the year I finished, but I uh, did my project for my uh, second degree on a BBC Micro. Um, and wrote the Pascal compiler for it. Um, but I, there it is there, this one. But I, I wrote all these other things, some of which I, clearly here's my chemistry degree being abused roundly. <laughs> this is me having some fun, making adventure games, which I wasted hours and hours on the great. I wanted to work out how to write them. Um, and then some slightly more serious database and I got Shirley Conrad's Magic Garden. <laughs> the worst piece of software I've ever written. <laughs> and if we forget about it now, that would be great. But curiously, you, you're going to find that bits of the language parsing for this, of course, <coughs> ended up in this. And of course, I'm going to hear too. So uh, there's still some code I use that's got bits of Swings Adventure in it now. <laughs> but having done that Pascal compiler, I got uh, the job of uh, with you know, my first job ever was to join Acornsoft and lead the Acornsoft Computer Languages Development Group with these other gentlemen, Tony Thompson, Stuart Swells and Richard Manby, who worked for me there. Um, I worked for one week in central Cambridge in the Market Hill office, which some of you have visited, but it was so crowded that they got us another office, uh, just around in Green Street actually, above the camera shop, and um, we were the a lot that were moved there. We produced all these different computer languages. Um, either we wrote them or, more commonly, we got other people to write them and then all we did was essentially a testing and publishing job. So Arthur Norman, who you will hear more of, wrote this. Uh, Richard de Grandis Harrison IV. Martin Richards, who invented BCPL, was responsible for this lot and for the logo compiler. Uh, Pascal Comel. There were more than this, I couldn't find pictures of them all. I think we did uh, Fortran, we did C eventually for the BBC Micro. But um, having burned our way through all of the computer languages, it was time to look at doing something a little bit different. And my group got to write some terminal emulator software, but the real beginning of the, the thread here was we wrote the graphics extension wrong. This was because if you read through the um, user guide, and you looked at every single OSByte in the operating system, in the ones about graphics, it said some of the calls were reserved for this graphics extension ROM. So I tried to find out what it was, and it didn't exist at all. <laughs> so we thought, right, well, we're going to write it then. And um, Richard Manby, who worked for me in the languages group, uh, was the guy that wrote this. Um, and we worked very closely with David Seal and the others. That's, uh, Acorn over at Fullbourne Road, where ARM is now, to specify what was going to happen. We would be added all the circle plotting and uh, pie chart plotting code and flood fill algorithms and so forth, bundled them up into this sideways ROM and published them as a separate ROM that you could buy. Um, but I kind of put this little strange activity that we were doing down the road at Acorn Soft on the map with, our, with the parent company with Acorn because they were in the throes of building the next generation BBC Micro, Project C as it was called, um, which eventually turned into the BBC Master. And they decided that they couldn't have um, this being launched until we'd also put all of that software into the operating system of the Master. 
So actually, that was our first step as Aplesoft in having anything that we did shoehorned into the, the operating system. So here's, here's, well, here's you can recognize this from the BBC Micro. It is the typical memory map. And um, we've got a bit of operating system workspace down at the bottom here. User program area, dynamic variables above that. The basic stack, if you were running basic, would be coming down this way. And then the RAM for your graphics would sit here to halfway up the memory map at 32K. Then you've got your page sideways wrong, where the basic interpreter would sit here and the operating system and some I.O. and system ROM at the top here. So obviously the graphics ROM was a sideways <coughs> ROM sat here and extended the operating system. And uh, the BBC operating system was really well designed for allowing that. If you made all your calls legally from your program into BASIC, into the OS, it could flip BASIC out of the way, bring the graphics ROM in, do the operations, paint it onto the screen, flip it back. So that was great. But there was also a desire with this uh, BBC Master 128 and the interim model, the B Plus, to add more memory. The, uh, that memory map was essentially full because the 6502 processor could only address 64K. So how do you get more stuff in there? Well, um, the first upgrade was to create shadow memory, which was paging this memory here, particularly the graphics memory. And in my talk at Rogel, I said this was invented by Wolford Electronics, which is a complete brain aberration. It was uh, Chris Jordan uh, of Aries that came up with the idea. I think Wolford also been aboard later. There might have been a bit of a to-do about that. But um, what that did was give you another bank of memory that was in parallel with your program and held all of the video uh, graphics memory. And that was done for the B+. Now, why am I telling you all this? Well, because the next thing that we did, I've got this, was, oh yeah, the B+, <coughs> 128. They wanted to add even more memory to it, so they stuffed the sideways ROM slots, the extra ones, with more RAM. So you not only had the shadow RAM for the video, but you had some RAM where, where the ROM sockets would be. That's like a mad idea at this point. I wanted to make BASIC be able to run larger programs. My Pascal compiler was written in BASIC and ran in RAM. It was a bit tight, <laughs> um, sitting in the 28K that you had, including the user's Pascal program and the object code that it generated. Um, that, that was a bit tight. So I really wanted a way of writing larger programs. And have we got a memory map? Yeah. OK, so we, we, Tony Thompson and I had a crazy idea, which was to turn that whole memory map inside out, upside down, and backwards. We decided that instead of having the user's program in, in the main RAM, we put the user's program in the sideways memory and it spread it across as many banks as there were, four of them in at 16K, would give us 64K, not 28 for the user's program. And we'd move the interpreter from that third quartile slot down into the bit of memory that was in parallel with the shadow uh, video RAM. And uh, we were told roundly that this was suicidal, an impossible thing to do because a basic interpreter written by Sophie Wilson was uh, very tightly coded and we couldn't possibly do all of the system calls to flip the RAM, RAM around, we'd run out of space. But uh, we did it, it worked, uh, it didn't slow the thing down too much with all of the paging that was going on and it got bundled with the uh, B plus 128 and the master 128. But again, I think this probably got onto uh, the radar of the management and they decided that maybe we could do some really quite hard things. So in 1985, this guy appeared, the second processor unit for the BBC Micro with the 3 micro R1. That's 3,000 nanometers in current speak. So it's a bit bigger geometry than we're used to today. And uh, as I say, probably 6.6 .6 megahertz, which is about 500 times slower than things clock at the moment. So, but huge step forward in computing performance compared to the poor old 6502 8-bit <laughs> machine at 2 megahertz. This was just 
unbelievable step forward for us. And uh, I just want to point out, it didn't have 25,000 transistors in it, not 1.2 billion that you get in a Pentium these days. And that's important. That's why we're all still using them. So, as I say, this was built and uh, the second process of boards were made as development systems. And they ran a, a little operating system, hardly an operating system at all, a thing called Brazil. But um, what Acorn then decided to do was to go out, they had an office in California, and they had a large team over there that were going to write a, a brand new operating system for these ARM-based machines. And this was going to be a proper operating system with preemptive multitasking, multi-threads, demand page virtual memory, all of the things that you, you, you know, have in a Unix system today. And they set out to do that, and they decided they were going to use the language Modular 2 for it, um, with a few extensions to Acorn's own, which is an interesting choice. But writing operating systems in high-level languages on machines of this era tended to make them slow, and particularly Modular 2, with all its enormous amounts of type checking that it does, makes it very, very slow indeed. Um, I compared some code written with that compiler to the one written with a basic compiler that I wrote later. And I took a bit of code that did uh, some, some of the graphics operations, so classically it would take 640 times x plus y, typical sort of calculation you had to do. And on the arm, you could do that in about five instructions using some of the uh, conditional instructions that we had at the time on the early ARM chips. Um, the Modular 2 compiler did 27 instructions and then called General Multiply. So it was a bit slow. Not only was it slow, it ran late because this was an enormous project and enormous projects always run late. And so gradually the pressure started to build. The hardware started to sort of run ahead of where the software was in terms of being able to deliver things. And so in 30 years ago last month, as I said, I was minding my own business and I got called into the boardroom and said, um, right, uh, you lot are not doing anything down there, writing your compilers for the BBC Micro, don't need any more of that. Um, can you make us an operating system? We want one just like the BBC Micro. You've got five months. Right. So I said yes. Um, I was, I was given the team that I had, the Acorn Soft Languages guys, augmented with a few other people. <coughs> so it was myself, Tony Stewart, and Richard from the Languages Group. And Tony wrote the core operating system. Stewart did the file switch, which underpinned all the other filing systems. Richard used his graphics extension ROM experience to do the graphics. Tim, Tim Dobson, who was an absolute wizard, who wrote things like Monsters and various other BBC micro games that you've all been tormented with, did all the text, sounds, keyboards, serial, all the other odds and sods. I got to try and keep them in order and I got to play with the I2C interface and the colour palette from VidC and a few other bits and pieces in my spare time. And then from the Acorn side, we got Nick Reeves, who wrote the ADFS filing system, and Brian Coburn, Brian wrote the Econet filing system, as he had done for the Beep. So that was the team, and we set off in September with some hardware and no tools apart from the assembler, because there were no compilers uh, apart from the Modular 2 compiler, uh, which we didn't want to use. There was no C compiler in existence at that point. Um, so we, we, we just uh, sat down and started, not really knowing where we were going, but taking on board the idea of copying the BBC micro. So, Okay, what did we do? Well, we were given this, and this is a, a rare beast. Um, I had one for a few years, I sold it a, a number of years ago, but um, to one of the collectors who might indeed be here, I don't know. But uh, this is the A500 second processor. So this had a whole bank of RAM here, operating system ROM slots, and then the four key chips, because Acorn have designed more than just the ARM chip. They also designed 
three friends, the memory chip, MMC, the video chip, VIDC, and the IO controller chip, IOC. So you can see the four key chips on the board here, all designed by Acorn, custom chips, uh, to make this computer as integrated as it could be. There's the tube interface, and this connected it to a BBC Micro that uh, allowed you to uh, bring everything up and get started. So when we first had these, we were running it much as a second processor. All the I.O. was going back to the BBC Micro, or the keyboard input came from the BBC Micro. And then the process that we went through was gradually to migrate the operating system functions one at a time and bring each of the subsystems on this board up. So we got the graphics up, or we got the memory up first, we got the graphics up, and then we started to bring the I.O. over, and you could, at one point, you could have a keyboard plugged into this, and a keyboard on the BBC Micro, and you could flip between the two, and it was very conf you could also flip where the graphics was coming out, so you could get horribly confused. Um, but uh, fundamentally, this, this could only run uh, as a parasite uh, running off the beep. Confusingly, it was then followed by this machine. This is the A500, as opposed to the A500 second processor. This has the same core chips, the same memory, and four megabytes of it, and power supply, a hard drive and a floppy drive here on the connected via the module bus here. So very, very similar to the actual production machines in architecture. And one of the key modules that we had was a tube module that allowed it to link to the BBC Micro. So the first machine that uh, we got, we were bringing it up using the BBC Micro, feeding the software into it, and then gradually breathing life <coughs> one module at a time into the other peripherals like the hard drive and the floppy drive. See, it had its own keyboard. This is actually my machine. The keyboard layout here was originally designed for ARX, so it's a very interesting labeling for special functions on the on the uh, keyboard. So you can see I've stuck orange labels over some of the keys and tipex them and written F12 on them instead of whatever the other buttons were. So if we have a look inside, there's the, the picture of that board. It does look very similar to its predecessor, but you can see the tube interface is <coughs> over here and it's got its own I.O. So what did we do with the software? Well, we took the view that we were copying the BBC Micro, and the key part that we copied from that was the idea of relocatable modules. If you look at the structure of a header of a relocatable module ever, it looks awfully like the way a sideways ROM would work on the BBC Micro. It's got the same header, the same entry points in the same order. But we took one further decision, which was to make the code completely position independent writing an assembler, we didn't have a compiler to uh, control what was going on, so we decided everything would be position independent and you could put your modules in anywhere in memory. And uh, I think that was a good thing. It made life difficult later, but uh, not for me. <laughs> so, When you started Arthur up, it came up with a command prompt, it looked just like the BBC Micro, as indeed do all versions as RISCOS 2 being booted up to its command prompt, and you could type basic and then basic interpreter would run and so forth. So I just want to say a few words about, about this. You know, we, we started with Arthur 0.01 and went right through, I think uh, we, we sold a few of those A500 machines to a few people in industry with early you know, 0.5 of Arthur on it. The one that everybody remembers is the 1.2 version because that was the one that uh, went into the real volume production machines. But we didn't stop there. We had 1.3, 4, 5 and 6 and eventually when we, when we were at well, I'd left, when they were getting around to releasing RISCOS 2, they changed the name from Arthur to RISCOS and the date 1988. So several years later. <coughs> um, I want to say about a few words about Neil Rain, because without Neil, this would have been a flash in the pan. This would have been a desktop this operating system like the BBC Micro. Sadly, Neil died in a hang glider accident a few years ago now, but um, for the Beeb, for Acorn Soft, he wrote, I'm 
Defender, as it was originally called, uh, one of the best games of the early days. Absolutely amazing that he could get it to do what it did. And um, he joined the, the, uh, the Arthur team slightly later than the, the rest of us and started off writing the font manager. So without that, all our fonts would have been fixed pitch. So we did a bitmap based scalable font manager and then the outline font manager that exists now. And he also wrote the window manager, the WIMP manager, which originally in early versions of Arthur was you started it up as an application and you could write window based single tasking uh, programs. But it was his insight that uh, really changed it. So here's the glorious old Arthur desktop. This was using that window manager. It was a demonstration program of the window manager and what you could do, written in BASIC, by Richard, Richard Manby, who had done all the graphics, um, and so he just produced a, um, a, a, a BASIC program that produced this look and feel, just to show what the window manager was capable of. But caution all developers, all dilemma where will be delivered as part of the product by marketing. <laughs> they put it in the roll and shipped it, which um, wasn't quite the plan, really. But there you go. Um, but it started the trend that we had all these icons and the icon bar down here with uh, some things on this side and other things on this side. And the whole world still works like that. And I don't think anyone can tell you on any of your operating systems of choice why some things turn up over here and other things turn up over there but it all goes back to that it doesn't matter which desktop you use you're going to find that no one can tell you the answer so that was all interesting and arx was still being developed but it was getting later and later and there was a big showdown meeting in front of the board um, so the ARX team came over from California, they had an A500 with 4 megabytes of RAM and a hard drive and they ran, demonstrated their desktop GUI and had a, a clock ticking. A nice smoothly sweeping second hand, looked very nice and there and said, you can click and open another one and run several of these which you won't be able to do on Arthur because it can't multitask. Look, here's a second one, a third one and now a fourth. But when the fourth one ran, the system started to swap the page tasks in and out of virtual memory to the hard drive. And now the second hands on the clock were going clunk, clunk, clunk on the different ones as it went round, literally ticking once every 16 seconds. That's not quite so impressive. But they made a far worse mistake. They'd shown us the night before. <laughs> so our demonstration was a production machine with a 256k RAM and a floppy drive, no hard drive. Desktop GUI using Neil's window manager running a clicking, ticking clock face program written by Tim in BASIC. And uh, as you can see, we ran 16 of them and they were all completely smooth. Um, that, I think, finished ARX and cooked its goose. It was a bit cruel because their system was much more um, combat capable in the long run, but it just wasn't ready. And the hardware was ready. But we also had <laughs> Neil's wizard idea. At the coffee machine one day, Neil says to me, if we fool around with MEMC, the memory controller chip, we can swap page uh, programs in and out and move them around in memory, change them so that you can move one up into a parking area, but just move it, you have to copy the data, you can just use the memory controller to map its address and pull another one back in and make, it, make them all think that they're all the only program running in the machine in the bottom part of the address space. And if I do this in my WIMP poll event routine on the return from the call, so 
The program calls WimpPoll, finds out whether it's got anything to do, any messages for it, and comes back. That was already there. And he said, well, instead of coming back, what I'll do is I'll stash the context with the other program and return to that instead. Okay? And by doing that, we can have lots of programs all running in a common desktop. And um, so I said, well, that, you know, I thought that would never work, but um, I let him do it. And uh, sure enough, that's how it uh, then became the real big difference between the 1.2 Arthur, in fact, this was at 1.6 that this change was made, and everything from 1.6 onwards had this feature in it that allowed you to have multiple application programs that didn't know about each other, that all thought they were the only one in the machine. And as long as they remembered to call the WIMP poll routine properly, ask for what to do next, they could be halted, parked, and another one allowed a chance to run. And um, you know, that's where all this came from. I made all the difference. And that then became RISPOS 2 and went out the door in all of the later machines. So, I've got a few anecdotes that I'm going to come to, but I'm just going to say a word about that icon bar again. If you look the icon <coughs> bar up on uh, Wikipedia, it says this, and uh, actually mentions the fact that it was invented. Here it is on a, I think it's a Macintosh, isn't it? Um, but if you're familiar with Windows or some of the Linux-based desktops, they're all they all look like this today. And um, I decided when I designed this that. Uh, we get sued by Apple if we weren't very careful with this window manager. So at the time, Apple machines had a text-based menu across the top, the Macintosh and early versions, drop-down menus from there. So I thought, right, well, we can't use a text-based menu. It'll have to be icons, and we better move it to the bottom. So that's why the icon bar's down there. <laughs> um, as I say, Wikipedia does, does say that uh, Windows 7 Taskbar is decidedly dock like. Large icons. It says it uh, copied it from uh, Macintosh OS 10 and so forth, and then all, <laughs> uh, all of that was pinched from. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's even made its way onto the iPhone. Does this look familiar? Yeah, it does, doesn't it? So, that's the end of my slides. I was going to just say one little funny story about um, why the ARM chip uh, is in everything. I think I was speaking to Steve Ferber last year and he told me that, he, according to his estimates, more than half the mathematical calculations ever done by humanity in the whole history of time <laughs> have now been done on an ARM processor. Um, the reason for that goes right back to my slide where it said it only had 25,000 transistors in the first version. I discovered something very interesting. When we were trying to debug that first A500 machine and boot it standalone, having unplugged the umbilical cord to the BBC Micro, the thing just wouldn't behave itself. It would sometimes it would boot, you'd do things, and it just wouldn't boot cleanly. And we had several uh, companies that tried to fix this. And eventually, at one all-night session with myself, Stuart, and Tony, all there with Brian Coburn as well, trying to debug this perishing thing. And you, you could turn it off, and you turn it on, and it would come up. And you could turn it off, turn it on again, and next time it wouldn't come up properly. It was as if whatever you've been doing before was still <coughs> somehow affecting it. And it, that indeed was the case. Um, I'll just get, pop back if I can to the picture of the insides of the machine. Oh no, there's a bit missing on this picture. It had a fan. There was a little fan on the PCB to keep the memory cool. And um, it turned out that if you turned it off, then the fan would carry on spinning for quite some time with its inertia. And there's a nature of the electrical characteristics of motors that when you cut the power, they turn into dynamos. <laughs> <laughs> and 
somewhere from my 1A physics, I remembered that, and I, I thought, I wonder, and I stuck my finger in the fan to stop it. And if you did that, you could boot the thing reliably. <laughs> because the fan was keeping the big CPU running just off the back, back EMF off the fan. <laughs> These, the old processor ran with such a small amount of power that even that was enough to keep it running, not just in some zombie state with some of the registers not cleared down, but still running your code for 30 seconds after you'd cut the power from the power supply. You didn't unplug the, you know, this, this was unplugging it from the tube interface, which was where the power was coming from. But it was just stay alive. And that's why it's back in battery operated devices like every mobile phone in the world, that's why the you know, iPhone's got seven ARM processors in it, because no other architecture can, can do the same number of MIPS per watt. And what we did was combine that with something that was the operating system here, RISCOS 1 and 2, entirely written in assembler, so we didn't waste a single coulomb on jumping to general multiply routines and do it the hard way. And that was why it was so fast and why it takes such a short time to boot up. Um, I'll shut up there, but uh, I'll leave that picture on the screen. This is my favorite time in all my career, really, uh, was working on these things. I suppose there's, there's just one other thing to add, which was after I had left and you know, more of the rest of my career, we built uh, a uh, company called Amino that makes IPTV set-top boxes. And if you look inside all the early set-top boxes, there's a boot ROM operating system that fires up the little set-top box and then goes to star exec point boot, which then runs Linux. But it, the rest of that structure is modularized and got sideways ROM-like modules in there that uh, just straight out of this book. So it can't keep a good system down. We sold millions of those. And then I did a company called alertme.com with lots of little Zigbee sensors, made anyway, by British Gas, Hive system. That's all got this same structure in underneath. So um, we've, uh, I don't know how many millions of uh, different diasporic companies that have been born out of what we did back in Cambridge in the early 80s. But uh, we had our 30th year party a few years ago for the Acorn, and there was a book published, and there are just hundreds and hundreds of companies that have all come from the work we did on this. I'm happy to take any questions. I don't know how much more time I've got. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Well, that's perfect then. Yes. Can you say the name of that book? Uh, it was a special book that was published for the 30th anniversary uh, thing. I don't know whether it's got a particular name, but uh, the 30th anniversary of the Beat was, wasn't it? I'm not sure. In our headquarters. They probably got to go in our headquarters. I still go around the world telling everybody what the A in arm stands for. <laughs> <laughs> it's not advanced. <laughs> yeah. If you email me, I'll, I'll try and uh, find out who's got a copy. Yeah. So. Won't be on eBay, will it? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the question was how many ARM 7 processors were made for the BBC Master. So the BBC Master could take a 7 processor card inside um, as a, an upgrade, um, as well as one externally on the, the external tube interface. Um, I don't know how many of those were made, it probably not more than 10,000. It wasn't, it was quite expensive and by the time it was there and ready, it really got superseded by um, the first version of the Archimedes. And if you were going to buy a BBC Micro and an upgrade, it was the same to buy it. I'm sure there are somewhere, yeah. yeah. But the, the, the big A500 second processors, um, predecessor to that that I talked about. That was less than a hundred. They're, they're quite rare. Um, they, that was only built for the purposes of development and testing out the, the big big four chips. Yeah. So I've got a slightly technical question. I'm not technical myself actually. But we were having an argument last night about Linux advantages over RISCOS. 
and uh, there's things like memory protection, multi-threading, multi-processor, you know, multi-core, uh, yeah. various other features that RISCOS doesn't have. Yeah. And uh, the advocates of Linux were saying it was faster. Now, uh, I happen to know as a user that a lot of Linux people who have uh, tried RISCOS on the Raspberry Pi find it very responsive and actually faster than Linux. Now, well, my question is really this. Um, I'm thinking about, process by the way, by saying quicker, I mean processes like opening files, copying files, all that sort of yeah. stuff. It's all the stuff you normally do. Now, my question is this, if we, if we could afford the uh, programming engineers to put these Linux features into RISCOS, would it, in the same way, slow RISCOS down in, in booting and in simple file operations? It's, uh, a number of people have tried to look at adding uh, um, full demand page virtual memory and uh, multi proper time uh, time slice multitasking and so forth into yeah. RISCOS. It wasn't that easy. There were design, design decisions that date back to all of this era from the BBC Micro and the fact that it was supposed to do just what that did and uh, a bit bigger and faster. That paint you into a corner as regards trying to do that. So some of the way that uh, the uh, memory addressing is done and some of the way the exception handling is done make it really quite difficult to uh, add all of those features. That doesn't mean people haven't tried. Um, and I, I, I would say, you know, this, this story stops at RISCOS 2. RISCOS 3 came along and quite a lot more of that got rewritten in C at that point, which is kind of where we are today, which is good because it makes it easier to program and more portable, but it, it costs computing cycles. There's no doubt about the fact that um, uh, anything that you can write in a high level language, I can write faster in assembler, given enough development resource. Um, and really the speed of operation of an operating system and, and the, the libraries that run upon it is mostly related to how well written they are and how many layers you're going through. And Linux has got many more layers of stuff. Um, you know, there are some instructions that do things and there are other that just move you on. If you're going through layers, those clock cycles that are just branch instructions or subroutine calls, they're not really doing you anything. They're just making the structure of your program nicer. And I wouldn't criticise Linux for that. I think it's, I've used it many times for other, other tasks, but it's uh, it's big, it's humongous by comparison. You need hundreds of megabytes of RAM to get anywhere with it. It takes 30 seconds a minute to boot because it's doing so many uh, things. But there's no doubt that making things multitasking does mean they run slower and, but because they have to be more careful about what they're doing. They can't just dive in and say, well, I own the memory, that's mine, I'm having it. They've got to make sure that nobody else is using it. But do you have to have all these layers no, to, to have no. multitasking or multi-threading and so on? You don't have to, but uh, if if you're trying to build something that is a Swiss army knife, you know, it, it, that can do anything, then a lot of modularity and a lot of layering is probably a good thing. Because you don't know where the goalposts are, so you know, developing for um, a completely generic system that's going to live forever it does carry a certain development overhead, but I, I, I still I still hark back to these days. I train the young lads that work for me in my various companies to write small, efficient code whenever possible and not call a library routine unless you have to. Um, but one of my bugbears is, is really, uh, particularly for my set-top box work with Amino, is, is how the great lengths that people go to to try and avoid writing some kind of code by using libraries. Okay. So the classic thing is to decide, I've got this set-top box, it's connected to the internet, I'll write my user interface in HTML and JavaScript using the browser, because that'll be easy, because I don't have to employ proper programmers to write real code. <laughs> Result pain, suffering, and very, very <coughs> slow performance. So, yeah. Question about the, the floating point. You must have discussed floating point about 30 odd years ago or whatever. And you must have had a tactical or strategic decision not to go for it. Um, with, so, with, with floating point, um, 
the risk in reproduced instruction set computer had only 27 instructions in it at the only 27 <coughs> machine language instructions. There was no room for floating point, and if we put it in there, uh, it would have made a huge uh, impact on the design of the chip. Now, the design of the chip was Steve Thurber and, and Sophie Wilson, uh, and they, they aimed for making it small and fast, and you, you know, keep it simple, therefore it would be low power and fast. And that was the whole ethos of, of, of risk. Um, we, we, had a, we did have a floating point coprocessor chip for this as an add-on, and there was a coprocessor interface on the arm and a, a set of instruction protocol uh, <laughs> for calling it, but the number of clock cycles needed to do a floating point uh, addition or division was huge compared to one that you could do for an integer thing. So. <laughs> didn't even have an integer multiply in the first one. Um, uh, the, the multiply instruction came in with the arm the, two. Um, they, they, we, we just, but you don't know, really need it. It helped. But all these fancy GPUs and so on, you know, they, they do all the hard bits for you. Yes? Did the languages group that you were part of actually write the modular two compiler that the ARX guys ended up using to try and, you know, do their effort? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, my, my languages group was, was uh, working on compilers and interpreters for the BBC Micro right. that we published by Acornsoft. Um, the compilers for the ARM uh, that they produced, the modular 2 compiler, I don't know where that came from, actually. I think they got one and ported it okay. out, out of uh, the Unix world somewhere. Um, and then it was quite a while before a C compiler turned up. Mm. I think we basically finished the project before the C compiler <laughs> was ready. And that was Lee Smith, and uh, I think he's possibly still with ARM. Um, but uh, those, those guys produced that. And it was Arthur Norman who wrote the Lisp interpreter for the Beeb, mm. and Alan Nycroft at the computer lab that produced that Norcroft compiler, which was the first one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. If, if world turned out different, uh, we will be on the beach somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and the world adopted ARM um, and uh, risk of us. Do you think we would or would not still have this situation where we need to go to work every morning and spend their first five minutes waiting? <laughs> I think we all know the answer to, to that. The risk of us so much faster. Um, the reason I had to come out now. I humbly apologise for my Windows XP laptop. <laughs> and the reason I got here 10 minutes early <laughs> was because I had to boot it up. Um, but, uh, yeah. It's appalling. <laughs> Absolutely appalling how, how much time is wasted uh, watching Windows boot in the whole world. I would add uh, that the more users you've got, the more bells and whistles get added onto any piece of software, and eventually they all tend towards being a dog. So, I mean, if RiskOS had many hundreds of millions of users, it would probably be bloated and slow, and we'd all be thinking of the next great thing. There would be some simple cut-down thing inspired by what RiskOS was. So that, that's the nature of software development in my experience. It's very hard to keep any piece of software lean and mean as it grows a large user base. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.